everybody. Full house, that's great. Uh, my name is Diego, um, also known as the crazy Spaniard. Um, um, as was introduced, I work at Salesforce. Apart from this big tower, how many of you know what do we do at Salesforce? Seven people, that's great. Ah, some people do. Okay, so let's start with that. So I'm gonna give you an intro of what do we do to understand why. So the talk is about why and how we actually embrace web components, right? And hopefully some of the techniques and some of the stuff that we went through, it can show you uh, the possibilities, right? So if you go to Adidas.com, that is Salesforce. This is basically our commerce cloud, uh, and basically all the UI is built on top of Salesforce. If you have a problem on Hulu and you have to go to support, this is also Salesforce. The UI behind this is actually built on top of our platform, right? This is basically community cloud. And of course, if you are in Salesforce service, then you will use our bread and butter, which is a big, big single page app, uh, which is basically the, the, our CRM, that's for sales and service. And now what is interesting about these examples, right, is that, well, there there's has a massive scale. For example, here, every page has around 8,000, 8,000 components, right, which is, well, we need to scale. Uh, they're not just an application. The fundamental difference we have and the fundamental challenge we have is that we're a platform. That means that everything you see in the screen is completely customizable, whether it's customizable via metadata or customers changing something in the admin console, creating their own custom objects, custom fields, or simply they can create their own components and drag them on the page, right? Think about it. We have multiple authors and multiple versions running on the same page, all running beautifully fine. If we take a step back, if you think about the richness requirements that we have as a company, uh, the two are actually pretty interesting. Try to find a framework out there that fulfills multi-author, multi-versions, right? Try to put two versions of React in the same page. It just doesn't work for us, right? So we have to basically, on top of that, if our customers write a component today, right, they have to be working in the next 10 years, right? So for us, being able to be backward compatible and also forward compatible is really important. And of course, as an enterprise, we have to be accessible, personalizable, localizable, secure, and performant including some of the beautiful old browsers that we see in a second. Now, we build that, right? So all this stuff was real things working. Some of them have different technologies. Now, our developers are not really happy, right? They're not really happy because uh, eight years ago, we started building this UI. And eight years ago, they were not even half of the frameworks we are. And so the technologies that we have are very proprietary, right? Because again, we have to fulfill these uh, requirements that are not in the goals of most of the frameworks in a whole, right? And so, our developers really wanted something modern, something standard. They want to be able to basically build on top of something that they can reuse elsewhere, right? They want to use components in Salesforce and they can use this, they can use it in Adobe or whatever other third party provider, right? They just don't want to be stuck. They want basically everything brand new. So, although this was the, we have something working. Three years ago, four years ago, we, we wonder, what if we can start over, right? What could we build? How can we build it uh, if we were to start over, right? And that is actually what my team built. Uh, so three years ago, we had the opportunity to start from scratch and ask ourselves, if we were to start over, what would we do? And so we spent a beautiful journey of actually looking at what can we actually use? Like, what is the out there that we can leverage? So we started studying and, and look, talking to all the teams from all of these different uh, frameworks and I can remember, no framework will fit the use cases that you saw before, multi-author, multi-version, backward compatibility. Most of the frameworks have a different goal that, uh, that are not uh, bound to a specific you know, uh, release cycle. And so after a lot of thought and a lot of analysis of good, really good ideas for every framework, we come to an interesting observation, which is the web platform has managed to evolve without breaking anybody, right? If you remember our business requirements, our goal is to not break our customers ever, right? So that fits pretty well. Another interesting realization was, well, and the best way to be future-proof, right, is to align as much with the standards as we can. And that fundamentally means that the best technology that fulfills these requirements are web components, right? Web components give us interoperability, it gives us encapsulation, it leave us future-proof because it's based on standards, and it gives us backward compatibility, right? So it just made sense, right? We didn't, it, take us a while, it took us a while to arrive to this conclusion, uh, but that's kind of at the core of what we're building for the last three, four years. This is what, we, what that web component was about. Now the problem is web components are very low level APIs, right? There's a set of specs that give you uh, a lot of power, but I cannot ask all our 
customers to write this. It's very verbose. The ergonomics are not great. And you saw the presentation earlier. Uh, Lead also has some abstractions on top of that. So what do we build? Uh, we build a framework that is syntactic or super on top of that. And uh, again, remember that Salesforce will have to support all browsers that are not don't have the latest and greatest. So that's how we build Lightning Web Components. LWC stands for Lightning Web Components, and it's basically our open source library that is basically syntactic sugar uh, on top of Web Components. And what that give us? Well, that give us better ergonomics. So we'll see them in a second. Give us uh, the ability to fill some gaps on the where the specs is not particularly clear right now, like accessibility. And it allows us to basically make it work in all the browsers, right? which is really, really important for us. Now, this is an example of how the framework looks like. Right On the top, you see some markup. Uh, it's basically pure HTML. It's actually valid syntax, syntactical HTML, but valid parsable HTML with some specific bindings. And on the bottom, you see that basically the fundamental difference here is where the syntactic sugar. Instead of extending HTML element, we extend lining element, which is our own abstraction. But for the most part, it's a standard JavaScript, nothing that we invented, nothing proprietary, right? It's just syntactic sugar. Now, that's the good part. The reality is, as you know, and some of you probably have tried that. Uh, it's hard sometimes to get web components into, uh, especially when it comes to old browsers, right? There is a lot of things going on. So I'm going to talk about two main things that we did and so see how we solved some of the problems. Uh, one is Shadow DOM encapsulation, right? Shadow DOM comes with a lot of interesting good things and, uh, let's say, new mental models that is hard for people reasoning, right? And the other thing, so we're going to talk specifically about testing, how we actually managed to run our 500 million tests uh, supporting with Shadow DOM and again supporting all browsers. We're going to talk about styling and theming, which then uh, um, Justin is going to expand on. And of course, I'm going to give you a very beautiful uh, work around um, uh, analysis on how we actually make everything work on I11. Yes, you heard it right, I11, because 43% of our traffic is still on I11. So yes, you heard it right. 43% of our traffic, as of yesterday, is still coming from I-11. Yes, I know. <laughs> so let's talk about I-11. <laughs> so in fact, we're not going to just talk about I-11. We're going to talk about any browser that is actually very low ca capable, right? Like a very old versus of Chrome, very old versus of Firefox. So we're going to walk you through the journey of some of the things we did, because I think they were valuable for potentially some of your projects as well. Now, the first part is JavaScript, right? Uh, we wanted to support the latest and greatest spec, not necessarily related to our components, but many features like ESX modules, ESX classes, they're not available in all browsers, right? So what do we do? Well, we polyfill. Now, it's not as simple as just putting off polyfills out of the shell. There was a lot of bugs that we found, a lot of specifications that were uh, implemented incorrectly, so we had to build a bunch of, uh, of them, contribute them back. Um, when it comes to performance, we had a lot of issues with, again, some of the language features that they were not ready, like, for example, pr public fields were not ready when we started. Uh, decorator is still uh, almost there, but not quite. So there's a lot of stuff that we had to do on the translation end. And our reactivity model on the framework, which we're not going to cover today, but it's very, think about in React, it says state in Ember is like a, a track. So our reactivity model relies on proxies. And proxies are not I11. And in fact, no one has actually implemented proxies on I11 until today. So hopefully, in a week or two, we're going to open source all of, the, all of this uh, stuff, which allows you to run any arbitrary code with the latest and greatest JavaScript feature, including proxies on I11. That was a lot of months uh, of my life wasted. But. Uh, now, Shadow DOM. Remember, um, in I11, we don't have Shadow DOM, right? Shadow DOM is this mechanism of encapsulation. and so. We wanted to emulate something equivalent, so it works on I11, right? So while there's a lot of libraries that do uh, Shadow DOM uh, simulation, that was not sufficient for our performance requirements, right? So for example, things like CSS encapsulation, like how do you make sure that the CSS you write does not going to leak, uh, which is the fundamental principle of Shadow DOM, right? So we basically build a compile time tool that will allow us to transform the CSS to make it compliant. We did the same for CSS variables. There's no CSS variables on I11. Well, we make a, uh, basically our compiler be able to actually parse and, and produce something at runtime that can actually make it work. Uh, and again, we took pieces from uh, a lot of good work that the Polymer team did on uh, Synthetic Shadow with their Shad implementation. We took some pieces. We basically uh, redid some, and, and basically, for again, for performance, right? Um, and other things like focusability and tabs, et cetera, et cetera. Now, interesting enough, while implementing a lot of this stuff, we run into a bugs not only on actually i11, but also on Chrome or Safari. 
for example, we have to file a lot of issues against, well, a, lot, a couple of issues on Chrome because with a lot of CSS variables, there was a performance problem. Uh, so basically, we had to fix Selenium, right? Selenium was not really supported uh, on I-11. And in fact, we're the maintainers of I-11 web driver. Who would have thought? Uh, we actually implemented web components in, in, in JSDOM, right? So now, if, when you're running JS, we can just use uh, web components natively. So that's part of the work we did to make I-11 work. Um, that, that's, that's enough for the JavaScript, right? So, and the shadow DOM, and this is basically the work of I-11. And the point here for you guys is, we've done it. It's done. You guys can probably hopefully leverage it uh, once we open source all the stuff. Now we're going to talk about shadow DOM encapsulation, right? Mostly we're going to specifically talk about testing and styling. If you think about Salesforce, we have around half a million to a million tests running every single commit to make sure that we don't break something. Now imagine changing all of that to make it work with Shadow. Well, it's, it's not, it's not, it was not fun. And what does it mean by that, right? Like it means that we no longer can reach uh, both from a style perspective or from a query selector perspective anywhere, right? All of the tests that are globally addressing some DOM that has a Shadow in the middle is not gonna fail, it's gonna fail, right? So how do we do that? How do, how, how do we manage to, to, to get that to work? How many of you have written a test like this? Come on. An XPath as beautiful as that? I know you did. But that's, that's, that's bad, right? But that is kind of the reality. People want to get things done, and sometimes they write, they write things like that. The equivalent code will be something where you basically, you tell Selenium to traverse the shadow one by one, right? So that is kind of where we need it to be as a consequence of implementing shadow DOM, right? We no longer can uh, basically work with the uh, query on top, we have to write something equivalent to that. Now that is very verbose and problematic. So what do we do? Well, to order, in order to traverse the, the shadow and make our tests work, we will have to rewrite a lot of tests, unfortunately, right? And so we basically uh, create both a programmatic and declarative representation of what a component is. And hopefully I'm gonna present in a year or so with all of the stuff uh, already finished. Some of the stuff is still in the works, but for example, in Java, we created a very simple uh, abstraction for allowing us to expand the shadow when Nexus. And we actually even created a, a page model, uh, I think, to be able to declare what a shadow was so we can actually traverse them in a more automated fashion. So yeah, it was actually a really, really hard time, hard work. And in fact, we're still working on it. But the reality is really, really, really improve the reliability and resiliency and scalability of our tests, right? And not allowing people to do all this crazy selector it's actually a good thing, especially at the scale, with thousands of engineers working on the same code base, right? So, although painful, it was actually overall a really, really good thing. And by the way, we actually met last week, was, we were in Japan for the, the W3C specification, and finally, WebDrive, we're gonna have now a new primitive to be able to actually go through the shadows natively on, on WebDriver, so there's no need for all the stuff that I showed you before very soon. Let's talk about the styles. Style was probably even worse than, uh, uh, than, than supporting testing. Before there were shadows, there were things like this. <laughs> right? Those selectors are bad, right? Why they're bad? They're bad because if I'm owning, I'm owning a component that is lining button, and I wanna change the spam for a div, I'm gonna break a lot of people. Remember all these beautiful pages like Hulu uh, and Adidas.com? Imagine changing a spam for a div. They're gonna be very pissed off at me, right? And the reason is because CSS inherently allows for arbitrary uh, CSS um, overrides, right? Which is really bad when you have a thousand components from different people running on the page. But, so this is something that we're still working on, but basically the fundamental idea is moving from a monolithic design system, right? That has rules that the one I'm describing above, which is basically compounded. Basically it's like find something that is a celery box and then find something that is a button and apply something. That is bad, why? Because if we were in the shadow world, probably there are two components there and you know, there's a ver barrier that it doesn't allow us to basically style. Now what we're doing is actually embrace web components, embrace shadow DOM, and use something like we have in the bottom, which is the CSS is more like an object-oriented style, and basically you declare all the variables you want to expose to at the outside with CSS variables, right? So again, much more clean, much more smaller footprints. Basically, instead of having this monolithic uh, CSS, we're going to have small pieces that are reusable, and that's much, much also better for scalability. Now, you will be wondering, you cannot just put CSS variables in everything. Well, you will be surprised so how far you can actually get with exposing a lot of CSS variables to customers. Uh, now, we know that it's not sufficient, and so we believe that we're very close to have a much more solution ready. 
we believe that with custom properties, parts, which then Justin is going to explain a little bit more later, and states, we can actually solve 90% of the post customization uh, problems that we have on the web, especially when we're talking about big applications. And in the future, what we're exploring is also allowing customers to basically take over these modules with a lot of restrictions that allows us to customize things in a same way, right? It's again, think about the CSS now as an API, and your component can actually expose that uh, rather than um, having to basically um, override everything. Again, the good part is in general, our CSS now is more sane, right? Forcing this to customers and for our, to ourselves help us actually read so much better about the components. On the beginning, I will get a developer telling me, man, why I cannot override all these styles? And after a while, after think, think, think through, he will tell me, you know what, this CSS shadow DOM is actually quite useful, and it helps me actually make a better decision on how we're gonna structure my CSS. So overall, although it's been hard, it's been really, really good for us and for our scale to move to a web component world. So let me get away with some takeaways. It was not, it was not easy. But our, our happiness really scale. We can actually have the web page that you saw before with thousands of components from different people and even different versions of the same component running side by side, no problem. Building on top of standards, it helps every single developer at Salesforce being productive not only at Salesforce, but take their components and move them with you. Right, so interoperability, as Gabe was saying, is huge, right? Taking a component and put it elsewhere, that is amazing, right? That's how our customers have been preaching for years, right? Now they have it for free. Again, Another big thing is as a new feature gets implemented on the browsers, guess what, we get it for free. When CSS templates, uh, when template instantiation is a, is, a, is a spec, we can remove a little bit of our code. And it's gonna be basically more native and faster and less code that we have to maintain. And again, our developers uh, are being productive. Anything they wanna search, they can search to Google, right? They can search for like connected callback or render cover or how all of these life cycles of web components work. There's nothing we invented, it's just a standard. Talking about developers, let me tell you some of the numbers that we have seen since we actually open source like about a year ago. As of last week, when I did the query, we already have one million components created. Remember, Salesforce might not be mainstream, but we have five million developers. <laughs> Those are a lot of developers. So last week, we passed the one million uh, components created. Uh, and what is interesting for us is 73% of the developers are already moving to the web, web components. We have our old technology, and we have LWC, so already 73% are already building LWC, so the old stuff, no one, cares, no one wants anymore. And more interesting, 95% uh, of the people who did a survey, which is again, I believe a couple of hundred thousand people, uh, believe that web component is the really right direction for us as a platform, right? So they want the interoperability, they want the standards, they want to basically learn once and reuse everywhere. And in fact, today, this morning, uh, we had a tweet from the community, or it was not even Salesforce, there was basically the guys behind uh, webcomponent.dev, they actually released a beta version for LWC uh, on, on the web, right? So again, that's a benefit of being open source and, um, and basically contribute back to, to most of the stuff that we, that we release. And with that, uh, we believe the future is bright, right? We believe that uh, little by little, the native APIs are gonna get bigger, and our future is to, for LWC to disappear. We want it to be literally a compile time thing, and runtime is everything is native. We will keep pushing on W3C and TPAC to basically make some of the features that we need in an enterprise, uh, like for example, custom registries, or like parts, or uh, style constructible style sheets. So we, that's our goal, and we believe uh, that we can all uh, make it happen. And with that, if we could do it, and we could support 11, so can you all, right? So it was hard, but Hopefully this proves that if an enterprise can actually make it a scale and making basically a single page app with 7,000 components per page work, so what can you? So I have some links there in case you wanna take a look. Uh, Framework's open source, the GitHub is there and the request for comments as well is open. And with that, thank you very much.